I am uh, Dr. Edith Perez, Deputy Director at Large of the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center and Director of the Breast Cancer Translational uh, Genomics Program. I'm honored and happy, actually, to spend my days working to help find an end to cancer. And while I have had the opportunity to be involved in a wide array of research in the context of leading clinical as well as basic research studies, many people still come and ask me what I do. They ask me about the research, they ask about the progress in the fighting of breast cancer, they want to know about research that deals with other malignancies. So it's good to have an opportunity to clarify this information. It's also good to do this so that people can better understand the progress of research. Today, it is my hope to share with you a little bit more about the advances that we're making here at Mayo Clinic, as well as explain to you a little bit of the process that we work through so that you can be as excited as we are related to the work that we're doing, the progress that we're doing, as well as the potential impact of this work on the lives of many people here in the United States, as well as other parts of the world. As you may know, seven years ago, it was a great pleasure for all of us to join forces with the 26.2 with Donna Marathon team, the National Marathon to Finish Breast Cancer. And this is a marathon uh, group which donates 70% of its proceeds to Mayo Clinic for cancer research. We are making great strides in our findings, identifying new genes and biomarkers that have the potential to offer new understanding of the biology of breast cancer, as well as offering new treatment options for women with breast cancer, as well as other malignancies, actually, in the very near future. Every year, as part of our collaboration with the 26.2 with Donna, I have uh, really the pleasure to also organize a meeting to speak to a group of clinicians about our research. I'd like to share with you the following from my co collaborator, Dr. Aubrey Thompson, about the progress we are making. But more than the progress, we want to explain to you how the process evolves from the beginning of the idea, as well as the specifics in terms of uh, the laboratory procedures that we follow to better understand the molecular basis of cancer and how that understanding may help us with ultimate patient care. Cancer is all about genes and genetic alterations. Tumor cells acquire genetic alterations that enable them to survive and grow under conditions that would kill normal cells. This allows the tumor cells to spread and to invade various organs in the body. These genetic changes are the great strength of cancer cells, but they're also the great weakness. Cancer cells come to depend on these genetic abnormalities, which can include mutations or extra copies of genes. The challenge is to identify the mutations and genetic changes to which a particular tumor is addicted and to figure out how to attack those alterations. That process starts with the analysis of hundreds, perhaps thousands, of primary tumors. We identify all the mutations and pertinent genomic changes in all the tumors and then sift through the data to try to identify particular patterns that suggest which of these are relevant to tumor growth and therefore should be developed as therapeutic targets. The development of new therapies begins with the process of target discovery. We start by identifying genes that might be of particular importance to a specific kind of tumor. That's just the first step. After that, we go into the laboratory and find out if the tumors really have to have that particular gene to survive. From the behavior of cells growing in plastic dishes in the lab, we predict the behavior of tumors in patients. The approach that I've just described has been used to identify several genes that we can target to treat cancer in patients. Our ability to match the right treatment to the individual patient often comes down to our ability to measure specific genes or groups of genes that tell us what drugs are likely to work in an individual patient. What I'm holding here in my hand is a tumor. This tumor was surgically removed from one of our patients and it's embedded in a block of paraffin. What we want to do is find out which genes are altered in this particular patient's tumor. So we cut a slice off this tumor, just like a slice off a loaf of bread, and that slice of tumor comes to us on a glass slide. 
This box contains samples from about 100 Mayo Clinic patients. And in this particular study, Dr. Chendris is measuring about 100 genes that are known to be involved in cancer. One of these genes encodes the epidermal growth factor receptor, which we call EGFR. What you see Dr. Chendris doing here is scraping away all the paraffin and then putting the small piece of tumor that remains in a plastic tube. She'll then add some chemicals which will dissolve the tumor tissue and leave only the DNA, the genes, behind. We'll then use that DNA to look for specific mutations and gene alterations that can guide us in how to treat that particular patient. So Dr. Chendris has taken the patient's tumor and isolated DNA. A lot of what happens from this point forward is done by big machines. The next step is up to the robot, which mixes the DNA with a set of chemicals that will specifically bind to different genes and enable us to count those genes. We mix the DNA with probes that are specific for each gene that we want to measure. The clever bit is that each of these probes is attached to a string of brightly colored chemicals that provide a sort of barcode. The order in which these colors appear in the probe is unique to each gene that we're going to measure. So red, green, yellow is EGFR and green, red, yellow is HER2. And in this case, we're measuring about 100 genes that are potentially therapeutic targets. Once the robot's done its work, we transfer the sample to a sophisticated machine that counts the genes. It's basically analogous to an incredibly sensitive TV camera that can detect a single molecule decorated with a bunch of brightly colored chemicals. From these colors, we can tell which gene we're seeing, and by counting all the brightly colored spots, we can, are actually counting the number of genes in that patient's sample. This is what the machine actually sees. Each of these little points of light is a single molecule, from the sequence of colors on each molecule, the machine can identify which gene corresponds to that particular point of light. The computer then counts up all the probes that correspond to each of the genes. From that information, we can calculate how many copies of each gene are present in every patient's sample. So, now after about two days of incubation, what we're able to see is the output of our data. In this case, although we've measured about 100 genes, we're seeing only about 20 of them on the screen. These genes came from tumors from six different patients, and we used two separate slides cut from each tumor. Each row corresponds to a different gene, and each pair of columns corresponds to a different patient. We also obtained data on the chromosome where the genes are located, which is helpful for reference. Now, normal cells have two copies of each gene. Looking at our data, let's focus on the EGFR gene. You can see that most of the patients have the normal two copies of that gene. But look at patient 2's tumor. It has 16 to 20 copies of the EGFR gene instead of the normal two copies. We know that tumor cells with that many copies of the EGFR gene tend to be addicted to EGFR. This patient is therefore more likely to benefit from a drug that targets this particular gene compared to a patient whose tumor has normal copies or amounts of the same gene. So, to summarize what you've seen in the last few minutes, genomic medicine begins as a research project to identify genes that certain tumor cells must have to survive and grow. We then have to figure out how to block the action of these genes. And finally, we have to figure out how to identify the patients who will respond to these new drugs. That's what cancer genomics and individualized medicine is today. So a lot of what we do in the laboratory goes into figuring out how to target not just one gene, but many genes all at the same time. This is the way cancer treatment is going in the 21st century, and being part of this effort is both highly challenging and highly rewarding. I couldn't imagine doing anything more satisfying or anything that has greater long-term benefit for our cancer patients. We've made a lot of progress, but we still have a great deal to learn about the biology of cancer cells. I've shown you one example of how we use genomic technology to identify patients who are likely to respond to targeted drugs. And there are several other equally promising examples that are being explored in the clinic today. There are many challenges to achieving the full benefit of this new genomic technology, but the future is very bright, and I'm convinced that we're going to win this race. Thank you. Improving our understanding of the molecular basis of cancer, which includes 
identifying genes and genetic material that can be leveraged for the development of new therapeutic targets is an amazing and exciting job. You know, the process can be a bit tedious and long, but the rewards, fabulous. We are making strides truly, truly every day. We could not do our work without certainly having ideas, but as important is to have support from people like you. We appreciate your understanding of what we do. We appreciate the belief that you have on us, the belief that you have in the possibility of making improvements. And through your participation in events like the 26.2 with Dana, you know, you can do this by donating, by being a volunteer, by running, walking, but also through other means, including generous giving directly to Mayo Clinic. Your support allows us to continue our mission to win the race against cancer. And together, I know we can. Thank you for supporting us.